Welcome to Kay Passionate. I'm your host, KP, a marine biologist with over a decade's worth of experience working with amazing marine mammals. And one of the more unique facets of my job has been the amazing opportunity to hand raise baby sea otters. So today, we're taking a deeper dive into everything that goes into rescuing, rehabilitating, and raising juvenile sea otters. Do me a favor though, before we get started, hit that like and subscribe button and head down to the descriptions below for ways that you can help support the channel. Let's start out by understanding a little bit more about sea otters. One of the first things to know is that much like humans, juvenile sea otters are almost completely dependent on their mothers. They don't have a lot of muscle control and their entire body is covered in a very thick fur called the lanugo. This actually prevents them from diving for a period of time after being born. They just float like little corks. This might seem a bit silly, but it's actually a great adaptation to have if you're a mammal out to sea. Basically like being born with a little miniature life vest. Noodlehead, what does that help ever do to you? Once the pup has shed its lanugo, the mother then needs to teach it how to survive out in the ocean. It'll learn things like how to forage for food, how to avoid predators, and of course, how to groom that beautiful fur coat. So this makes sense as to why the number one reason that a baby sea otter might need rescue is that it is for some reason found itself without its mother. There are lots of reasons that this can happen illness or predation of the mother, maybe it's a first time mom, doesn't really know how to look after a pup, or sadly, also human intervention. Since the pups can't swim or dive, the mother will often leave them somewhere, either attached to a piece of kelp, or even sometimes on the docks, piers, or even rocks of a beach. While the mother is away, a sea otter pup will sometimes vocalize. This is not a noise I can describe to you. I think it's best described by a baby sea otter himself. <laughs> this famous sea otter meep is a tool that a mother sea otter will use to relocate her pup, but it will also inevitably draw the attention of nearby humans. And it is of course our first instinct to want to reach out and to help. But that's why it's so important that the first step in any rescue or rehab is actually just observation. Because there is always a chance that the mother might return. So you always want to call the proper authorities who will then decide when or if it is time to step in. Once it is determined that a rescue is in fact necessary, the trained staff will come out, rescue the animal, and get it warm and dry first things first. Mostly, this involves rubbing the body to make sure that it is nice and dry, doing a quick medical exam, and hopefully a first feeding. Young otters must be fed about every two to three hours, so around the clock supervision is absolutely critical, especially for very young otters. And most of these rescues will not have even been weaned yet. So they'll be fed a mixture out of a baby bottle that is usually something like blended up clams and something called espilac, which is actually just a basic puppy formula of feed that you can get at any pet store. We usually also mix in some basic infant baby gas reliever that helps to alleviate some of the gas that the animal might build up from eating something that's not quietly its normal mother's milk. Here's a clip of me bottle feeding Rialto shortly after he was first rescued. You'll probably notice the poor video quality here, and that is because the video was taken around 2 a.m. Like I said, they need around the clock care. And we've got some clams. The formula is prepared and made fresh about every 12 hours and weighed out for each feed to the gram. 
especially during the early weeks, weighing the baby otter and its food intake are critical to making sure that the animal is gaining weight. At first, this is a very easy process. Sea otters, like we said, don't have a lot of muscle control, so you can essentially just plop them on the scale or even inside of a bucket. Later on in life, though, we can teach them to actually step on the scale and essentially weigh themselves and help us in one of their very first husbandry behaviors. You can see that happening here with baby Taslina. But let's not forget that what goes in must come out. And a mother's sea otter will normally stimulate her pup to either urinate or defecate by licking or putting the animal into the water around them. This is similar to what we see when mother dogs do this with their young puppies. So what we'll do is normally pick up the animal and place them in a bucket of water, maybe splash some water on them. This is usually enough to stimulate that same thing. After the baby otter is fed, cleanup usually takes place next. Eating can be messy. <laughs> we do this cleanup by grooming them by hand. We have lots of different tools that we can use in our repertoire. A comb or even a blow dryer set to cold and lots and lots of towels. We can also use a comb or even our fingers to separate mats or tangles that happen on the otter that could possibly compromise the waterproof quality of their fur. While we don't want the animal to get too cold, it's equally important that they don't get too hot. Sea otters have an incredibly high metabolism that allows them to stay warm in the cold water that they live in. So we want to make sure that they stay cold when they're sleeping out of the water. So we will usually keep a fan blowing on them in their little sea otter crib, as you can hear here in this clip. When the sea otter is sleeping soundly in their custom sea otter crib, we're usually on cleanup duty or preparing the next feed, doing a number of records about the previous sessions with the animal, or doing lots and lots of laundry. The laundry has to be cleaned in a very specific way. Because sea otter's fur is so sensitive, we don't want to use any harsh detergents. We use a very mild detergent and put the washing machine on an extra rinse cycle to make sure that all soaps are removed from the towels. As the animal gets older, we can start to introduce longer swim times and even deeper pools. How are you? We can start them on a small amount of solid foods and gradually use that to replace the milk mixture with a variety of things like clams and squid. It is around this age that the DFO here in Canada, or the NOAA in the United States, will make the determination about whether or not the animal is releasable. We covered this in a previous deeper dive, and you can check out that video right here. But both the US and Canada have pretty strict guidelines on the release of sea otter pups. Because of all of the hands-on care that we've discussed throughout this video, if a sea otter is rescued at younger than six months old, it is typically a non-releasable animal. Once the animal is deemed non-releasable, it's time to start thinking about introducing it to other otters. The first animal that you'll probably start with is an animal that you think has maybe some maternal instincts. Like we did here with Taslina and Tanu.
But my job doesn't end there. Having an animal under human care is a forever project, when it is our job to always make sure they are healthy, happy, and well taken care of. Fantastic. <laughs> You're not supposed to sit on a cake. So there you have it, an inside look at the most rewarding parts and challenging parts of taking care of marine mammals. I think I covered most of it, but if you have any questions, drop them in the comments down below. You can even come on over to my Twitch channel where you can ask me live. And if you like what you saw, click on this paw to subscribe. And I'll see you next time on our deeper dive. Pretty cute eyes.